And to start with, I would like to say thank you for Sarah and Haley, um, as well as John Paul Noons, RIBA, and Norman Foster Traveling Scholarship Judging Panel for this exceptional opportunity. Tonight, I would like to talk about anatomies of informal sit uh, settlements. And the question is, why is it important to talk about informal settlements, also what is known as slums? And at the moment, 33% of people living in developing cities live in informal settlements. And by 2020, 45 to 50% of people will be living in urban poverty. And in order for us to talk about modern cities, we need to understand the ancestors. Um, and in my case, I'm looking into Victorian London and Charles Booth poverty map of 1889. So my research started in with looking at his map and trying to find why informal settlements form in specific areas in the city. And as Charles Booth said himself, uh, so long as low class ex exist at all, it evidently has to lodge somewhere. And the question is, where? Why do slums form in specific areas? And to start with, I started looking into what I call determinants. And determinant could be anything describing physical location in the city. So the first determinant was road patterns. And as researcher Martin Gaskell said, the site of slum was usually a nest of secluded streets or course of the main street and without through traffic. And this was the case in Victorian London. And most of the slums were a clusters of slums hidden behind the main roads. After that, they looked into topography. And it was believed that low-laying areas, which had poor drainage, attracted dereliction consequently attracted poverty. And actually, 34% of slums in Victorian London were located in these low-laying areas. Then I looked into railway lines, as they created boundaries and prevent, sort of protected the informal settlements from the public eye. And 20% of slums were along the railway lines. After that, I looked into rivers and canals, as they provided a water source as well as natural drainage. And quite few informal settlements, which is the dark dots, were located around the rivers. But that was not the only reason. After that, I looked into facilitators. And what I call facilitators is basically a low source of income, which in Victorian London was uh, gas works, uh, labor job opportunities, and docks. And most of them were located around the river and also the canals. After that, I looked into markets and found out that every single market in Victorian London had informal settlement or a slum within 15 minute walk. So at this stage, I formed a methodology how I could actually investigate and assess informal settlements. So I could look into determinants, which describe geographic locations. I could look into facilitators, so the sources of local income. And then I could describe the informal settlement in terms of its size, and also describe the quality of life within it by actually telling if people have access to the basis, basic services as gas, water, electricity, and sewers. And most of all, um, it's important to understand land ownership and city policies to understand why slums function in specific way, why they're organized in specific way, and they appear in their way. So Norman Foster Traveling Scholarship allowed me to use this methodology um, across the world in seven capital cities. So I went to Hanoi, Phnom Penh, Lilongwe, Nairobi, La Paz, and Quito, and also Sofia. So my trip started in Hanoi, in Vietnam, and the red areas mark the informal settlements in the cities. So to start with, I looked in the railway lines, in the picture here, and quite lots of railway lines were covered with informal settlements, as well as the canals in the first picture on the left um, had informal settlements around it. But what was very unique about Hanoi was that everything was organized in very dense labyrinths of dwellings and dark corridors. And why did that happen? Why did these tube houses, and we know now, why did they form? Apparently in 1800s, uh, people used to build shop houses with a small retail unit at the front, a living unit at the, at the top, and garden at the back. But later on, a policy was released limiting the shop frontage. 
So over time, people started building upwards and backwards. And over time, we came up, we are left with these extremely dense um, tube houses. After Hanoi, I went to Cambodia, Phnom Penh, very different city, and also found informal settlements around the railway lines, and also they had very small pattern of these roads, and they were always hidden away from the public eye. Um, there were some industries, like in the picture here, a warehouse, sort of surrounded by informal settlement. Um, there were lots of markets where local ladies traded, but most of the settlements actually were related to the water, or they were built on, basically, literally on water. And why did that happen? And people had a tendency to build everything in stilled houses, or houses on stilts. And during Khmer Rouge regime in 1970s, when um, uh, Phnom Penh was evacuated, people left. And after the regime collapsed, people returned and they found out that actually they lost their properties. So as they didn't have anywhere to live in, they started building their own new dwellings. And as the land was not available, they started building on water um, houses on stilts, which can be seen in Cambodian countryside. <coughs> the next city I went to was the long way. And I walked around along the railway lines. I went near the river. I went uh, along the roads and I couldn't find informal settlements. And it took me a long, long time before I actually identify what informal settlement in the long way was. And settlements there, actually <coughs> these very low density, rural looking communities around the periphery of the city. And I couldn't understand why did that happen. And when the long way was uh, planned, it was planned as a four node city. So it had four self sustaining city uh, sort of centers. And the gaps between them were meant to be infilled by residential development. However, the policies were too slow and um, the, the, the government couldn't release the land quick enough. So the local chiefs of surrounding villages were selling their own land to people. And now the long way is left with this extremely dense collar of quite low density uh, dwellings. After the long way, I went to Nairobi and I visited Kibera, which is one of the largest informal settlements um, in Africa. And Kibera is surrounded by a railway line on one end and by a river on the other end, has very few access points and actually very difficult to get to if you don't know where you're going. Um, the living standard is very, very basic. Um, and I also find out exactly the same tendencies as everywhere else that there was a railway line so surrounded by informal settlements, there were rivers. Um, and what is important about Nairobi was that absolutely everything had the value there, including keeping the goats on the wasteland. Uh, as everything has a value in Nairobi, the developments and slums have a value too. The whole Kibera slum is run by more or less 300 landlords. And what they do, they build blocks of small houses, 14 me square meters per dwelling, so that would be a standard for a family, and they would let it out. After this, I went to La Paz uh, in Bolivia, and that was a very different city once again. So there was no railway line, there was no river, um, there was very dense sort of net of roads, and also the topography is very significant. La Paz is known as one of the highest laying um, capitals in the world. And the city center, which is in the map, is in the center. And it's surrounded by very steep slopes on each end. And that's where the informal settlements were. And why were they in the, in the hills? And there were quite few reasons. One of them was that um, the land in La Paz is in extremely poor condition. And land, landslides are quite frequent. So in other words, it's quite dangerous naturally to live there and habit habitat in these areas. Also, it's very dif difficult to get there as you have to sort of climb hundreds of steps to get somewhere. Um, and also the interesting part about La Paz is that once you go up these steep hills, actually the informal settlements seem to disappear. And why that happens? Um, every single road is surrounded by massive concrete or brick walls, so you actually never see what's happening behind them. 
and you then see little tiny doors, and if you open them, there is a little private life of informal settlement behind it. The next city was Quito. In many ways, it's very similar to La Paz. It has extreme topography and huge slopes everywhere and very, very hard to walk around. So on one edge, it has massive informal settlement, which is in the steep hill, very hard to access, very hard to get to. And what is interesting about Quito, that once you're in the lower areas and you look up the hills, everything looks really colorful and pretty because all the facades are painted in many colors. But only once you get up and go behind these dwellings, you realize in what sort of poor and crumbling condition they are. So it's sort of a way of hiding it, almost. The last city I went to was Sofia in Bulgaria, and I call it EU slum, which is a very unfair name to call it. Um, and in some ways, it's very similar to Kibera, because it has a railway line on the top, and has a forest at the bottom, and has very few access points. So it's very difficult to get to. And Fakulteta area is unique because it's based on ethnic issues. Um, the community which lives there is Roma community, and Roma community is known for traveling. Um, and very often, once they settle in, they leave quite quickly, so they never stay for long periods of time. <coughs> so this is just a little image showing the sort of very tiny, tiny dwellings and how they develop over time. So. In summary, um, Charles Booth, when he started doing his research, he said the maps were to describe things as they were so that eventually a theory might be derived from this acute picture and policy provided which should eradicate the ills he described. So this is my version of a theory. So every city is unique and the slums appear in many different ways due to the policies and laws. However, what is in common is the way the informal settlements formed. So what I could do is draw a basic graph and describe every single location in the city by drawing an x-axis which describes a location in the city and y-axis which describes a level of danger in this location. So that might be a real danger or perceived danger. Then we could sort of split this whole entire um, amount of units into desirable and undesirable locations. And then somewhere at the top we could have vulnerable locations. So let's say we have a cross-section through a city, and if we have a railway line at the very beginning in the city center, it's a great location, it's desirable. However, due to the railway line, it might seem a bit dangerous. First, it sort of straight away pushes this, us into undesirable zone. If we move away from the city, let's say there is a steep slope and there are some landslides. So it's quite dangerous, let's say. So once again, we are in undesirable location. But what happens if we create a facilitator? Let's say that would be a mine or a source of income. And we create a mine along the sort of more dangerous area. And in this case, I believe that's where the informal settlements happen. So to create a formal settlement, you basically need a good location, which is hard to access, um, level of danger, which might be real or perceived, and also the facilitator, which is a source of income. So thank you very much. Any questions?